My name is Monk Rowe. I'm very pleased to have Bill Easley for my a guest here for the Phileas Jazz Archive. And uh, y you are Zooming in from where? Durham, North Carolina. It looks nice there. Uh, and I'm in... Oh, it's lovely weather. Yeah. I'm... I don't leave my house. I, I just, I'm comfortable here. I don't go anywhere. All right. When, when you describe what you do, because you've had a very versatile to, versatile career, do you, when you describe what you do, do you have a a sort of short way of summing it up? Well, I music is my livelihood. Life is about the study of human behavior, human growth and development. And I am 75 and I would like to become a psychiatrist, but they told me I would have to go to school. So, but I'm an, I've always been an amateur psychologist my whole life. And music is just what I do to go to pay my bills. Being a musician and being in all these different situations, did your intense um, behavior in looking at other people's behavior, did music give you a chance to observe a lot of different kinds of personalities? Sure. And some people, you know, they have certain things that they think are uh, unique to musicians. But my study, musicians are just people just like everybody else. And some of them, some of, Cannonball made a statement one time on Live to New York, and he talked about people who are who act like they're supposed to be hip or so. You remember that statement? I so do. I, I heard that as a teenager, and it resonated in my head because it wasn't, he wasn't talking about musicians per se, but it's but people in general that just try to pretend that there's something, you know, rather than being themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that uh, statement made a big impression on me as well. Um, how did your family uh, come to live in Ole in New York? So my, my mother's family was there for, oh, from the 1800s or early 1900s. My great Migrated from Pennsylvania. My mother's grandfather was barber and sort of an intellect, you know. And my mother's father was a le electrician, in fact, an inventor. Uh, uh, Olean, as you, you you know about the area, it wasn't a large black population there in Olean. So, my the street that I grew up on. The, South Third Street during in my lifetime was a totally, totally, totally integrated street. In other words, you had diverse people, all kinds of people. So I grew up in a world of diversity and uh, there was all kind of people. And, uh, you know, not saying that race was somewhat of was a fact. In other words, no, I didn't have any black school teachers or way back in the in the 40s or 50s. There were no black professional people in my hometown that I knew, but were, music was a big part of my family. My grandmother graduated from a conservatory in Meadville, Pennsylvania in the 1800s. And so music was the bit was huge at my house. In other words, it was filled with music and you know, it was joyous, joyous, not just music, but very intelligent people. So uh, looking back, and I, I, my sister, I had older sisters that grew up during the Depression. So, but I came along when things were much better. Did the Eastley family uh, create a reputation in Olean and the surrounding area as, as those music people? Call, call them when you well, need music. Well, the, the, actually, my mother, her, her, that was the Barnes family. You see, Barnes. And, and say, for instance, my mother's mother, my grandmother is the one that went to conservatory in Meadville, Pennsylvania. But her father was bandmaster. In other, in other words, he played all the, back like 
John Philip Sousa or something back in the day, and he played all of the instruments. And his son, which would have been my great uncle, Darwin, played saxophone, and my mother's brother, Darwin, played saxophone. So I'm a fourth generation musician, but a third generation saxophone player. If I could go back in time and uh, drop in on a gig that you were on when you were about 15 with the, with the family band and and write down every tune that you played and <laughs> yeah. what, were, what would some of the okay. titles, what would some That's, of the titles be well naturally it's all all the the american songbook gershwin cole porter you know uh sophisticated duke ellington we played the the, the same songs the major portion of my livelihood uh, in for 62 years. You understand? The same, same song. Now, funny, funny story. My father, in other words, we trapped because not only we worked all in the immediate area, that towns in Pennsylvania, say for instance, I, I don't know if you'd call it a territory band, but we travel maybe 40, 50 miles to Emporium, Pennsylvania, or the Wellsville Country Club and all of these various things. And back, and so we travel in a car and you had an upright bass and the sound system and a set of drums. So you'd all get in a one car and go to the gig and we'd set up and but my father, after setting up the drums, he, 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 every, every time he'd say, oh, what are we going to play? What are we going to play? Uh, uh, almost like being in love. <sighs> because he called the same tune every day. <laughs> and, he would come, and he would say, you know, he'd play the intro and then he'd sing the song and the party was on. Well, know? is that because uh, you played it as a businessman's bounce well, and I, no business. But I, I had I made a record called. Business. I know you did. That's why I asked. And it, and it stemmed from the term musicians used to use back in those days. And so, see, it's hard to explain how things how different. Back in, a musician back in those days knew that his job was to make people feel good. Not where it's, and the people would, when they walked, be at a country club or a juke joint or jazz club or whatever, people walked into a club or wherever you were playing and they'd worked hard all week long and they would come in with almost like a challenge. And it was like, make me feel good. That, and you knew that that's what your job was. So say for instance, if you're playing a dance or a country club, the whole thing was, okay, get the people out on that dance floor. And so you'd play it to it, and, and sometimes they're reluctant and resistant. So they would sit there and say, okay, well, what do we play? And then, so he tried to think of, let's play Stardust. And, so, and then he'd say, call it to and he'd say, businessman's bounce. Which meant like a two beat, boom, 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 boom. And that, and, and it, most people can count to two. And so they would get out on the dance floor, They'd move one foot on this beat, one foot on this beat, and the next thing you know, they 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 thought they were dancing. And at some point during, but you would make people swing who had no intentions of swinging and didn't know what swinging was. But when they got sat down, they know that it felt good. You yeah. Know? So that was pretty much the psychology of the of the deal. Yeah, I love it when you. Um... You do that, and you you know you somewhere after they get started, you switch to four four. There you go. And they'll respond to that. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think of this one tune of Cannonballs, and that's that's you know he they're not just you know not just the the musicians who really knew how to take people on a journey. They knew how to do that, and it would evolve. It would start like I say, boom, boom, and then eventually you know. Two spot, but eventually it turned into a circle to where it was like, you know, it's all about. Yeah. What did your father think of the rock and roll intrusion into pop music? Okay, well, that kind of came much later. I mean, that was in the 50s or, you know, going into, there wasn't no such thing. They had rhythm and blues, mm -hmm. but 
rock and roll. See, you got to realize my father's band, they st- it was in, it started from 1928. My father came to Olean, New York. He was on the road with a five piece band. And somehow they, back, you know, you got to realize what the roaring 20s, for, so to speak. And there was all kind of live music and speakeasies and musicians traveling all over the place. Sometimes a musician would migrate, answer an ad in a, a magazine looking for a saxophone player who reads and fakes. And so a guy may go halfway across the country looking for work. You see? That that's how it was, and I sort of caught the tail end of that kind of uh, uh, procedure. So, what at what point did you get the idea, or were you forced into being an improviser? No, it was it was automatic because because I heard music from the womb. In other words, I heard my, my mother played piano and up until I was the day I was born, you know, I'm just playing at the local moose club or something like that. And she's pregnant. And, and so I literally, and I, I mean, I have no documentation, but I pretty much learned the American songbook in the womb. And improvisation, naturally, I, when I started listening to when I started playing and listening to records and understood what improvisation was, right away, say for instance, I'm listening as a teenager, I'm listening to Cannonball and John Coltrane. So when I would get on the job, I would be, I'd be ready to stretch out. And my father would hit the snare drum and he'd say, play the melody. And I'd look around like, oh, you big square. But I would but I wouldn't say that to him because I was afraid. But I, I so I played. So I had to learn absolute correct mem. And to this day, I can play straight melodies. Much of it has to do, and in order to do that back in those times, you had to learn the words to a song so you could understand the the the, the uh, rhythm of the music. So that's something that I've always, that I've done from instinct or being forced and understanding the importance of it. But there's a lot of great, 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 great players and improvisers that if you ask them to play a straight melody, they'll be able to do it to save their lives. You understand? So that's very common. It, it's interesting you say that because I was listening to your recording of um, for all we know, mm-hmm. and it was it was just simply gorgeous, and I thank you so much respect for the melody, and then I'm I'm hearing uh, shades of cannonball in your sound, something wow. about, something about your vibrato. <laughs> I wish <laughs> <laughs> he was my all time favorite. Me too. He was my all time favorite. Still is. Can you yeah. recall what um, an average gig with this family band what kind of money did you make okay back then you have to realize that where my my house was a musician June see mm-hmm. so scale in 1964 uh, uh oh no not in the late 50s in other words scale basic scale twelve dollars per side men and then a leader was five dollars extra for the leader so and scale was minimum wage so to speak if you're a union musician scale was twelve dollars for the side men and five dollars extra for the leader so the first job that i played with my father when i was you know about 13 years old dance and I just I played just clarinet at that time and so and I by this time I'm going out to jam sessions with my brother-in-law and going to bars and things to Sunday jam session so my mother figured well since he's hanging in these bars and we might as well you know let him play with us so my first job that I made I made my father gave me the five dollars which was uh, you know the extra that he made that one time but after that had one job for five dollars, and from that point on, I was a twelve dollar man. You understand? In other words, I wanted I wanted the whole deal. 
And so I got $12. And so that I bought my father signed for a bank loan for me to get my first decent clarinet, which was a Selmer series nine clarinet. And it cost $330. So I had a bank loan and he, you know, he signed for the loan, but it was my bill. So I had to at least get one gig a month to pay for my bill. I had bills when I was 13. That's growing up quickly. <laughs> You're telling me. <laughs> and when and when did the saxophone come into the picture? Well, once I paid off my clarinet. You know, I was a junior in high school by then. You understand? And yeah. and the clarinet because I started paying for it in the eighth grade. So by that, in my early part of my I. I I didn't start even playing the saxophone until I was a sophomore in school. So I'd been playing on these job, just playing clarinet. I started playing, I had a school horn, a tenor, when I was a sophomore. So then I had a Selmer clarinet, so I wanted a Selmer saxophone. Selmer saxophone in that day and age was $610. So once I paid off my clarinet, I got another loan for six ten, and payments were fourteen seventy five a month, and I paid that all through my junior year, senior year, and I got work construction after my senior year that summer. So when I left home in September, I paid off my my debt for my tenor, and so that that was that's how. I got my horns, but did did you question, yeah. did you go to Buff did you go to Buffalo to buy? A I used yeah I used to go there to see people and to yeah. you know the the colored musicians club and things. Right. From when I was a little boy. Yeah, they still have that there. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. you could have um, obviously gone into music. But did your parents want you to? Oh, I don't think my mother, she was all right with it. My father had no interest in being a musician. He was a musician out of necessity, you know, make money. And, and he had, he, but he was more of an organizer, more of a leader of men. He had the greatest gift of gab of anybody that I've ever met on this planet or probably any other planet. He had a gift of gab. A lot of people think I talk a lot. I never met Bob Easley. He could he could he could talk the paint off a wall. <laughs> was was a move to New York City a logical step at that time for a young musician? Well, my sister had gone to New York before I had. She worked in a, and, and at that time she worked with it. She had made a record with Sal Salvador had a big band and her sister was a singer in the band. And she, she went to New York, before, you know, a few years before I even thought about going to New York. I don't think I would have gone to New York had my sister not gone there before I did. Mm -hmm. Did just uh, one more question about Olean when, as a high school student, did music give you an identity in the school? I mean, because some, you know, some uh, young men are excel at being an athlete. Um, I'm just wondering if you had this reputation as an outstanding musician. That's a good question because no, I had a reputation as being a football player. Oh. I was I played varsity football as a freshman and I was captain of the football team as a junior but I, and I I wanted to play with the Cleveland Browns you understand but I weighed 127 pounds and was five foot five you understand and so and I never got me bigger I never got me big okay and, but I would but I love football was my life from the time I was about nine years old and music was was what came second the only thing I my, right before the first game of my senior year some kid smaller than me jumped on me and broke my ankle I never played my senior year and so the passion that I put into football and sports 
and transfer it into the into the music, even though I was always serious about music. Mm -hmm. So at the age of 19 or 20, there's a term that my classmates used to use when we were in college, and, and it was sort of, we want to make it. We want to make it in the music business. Good, 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 good idea. <laughs> my thing, in other words, my idea of making it, and to this day, from the time I was, I was, I had specific numbers and everything in my head from the time that I understood what was going on. But then and now, is to be a working musician. And I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but no, that's pretty much what, what my goal was and still is, to be, to be playing music and to work and to make this your livelihood. I've been able to do that for 60 some years and don't try this at home or don't try this without 100% commitment. That's what's required. And Billy, when you're in your interview with Billy Mitchell, talk about this thing, and Billy Mitchell used the phrase to you, he said, music, it's a calling. In other words, you don't decide you're going to do this. This is just something you're called to do and do it. And that's pretty much what you do. And maybe the reason is because you can't do anything else. I don't know. But as I said, I, I think I could have been a psychiatrist, but I'll never get to know. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, in order to make a living, then um, I observe in reading about you that a couple things happen. First of all, you learn to play a lot of woodwinds. Mm -hmm. And second of all, you must have had a wide range of music that you decided, well, I can play uh, with Illinois Jaquette and I can also play with Isaac Hayes. Mm -hmm. How did that well, come about? Nothing, nothing that you decide. You call, If the phone rings, you answer it, you know, and you play with whoever, if, if somebody calls you for a gig, and you got to realize, growing up in Olean, New York, man, I did, I wasn't, I didn't call myself. We played polkas. We played all kind of. We played the Sons of Italy and played all the Italian songs. And we play up. We play pretty much every gig that we play. I could play the Lichtensteiner polka. I could play the clarinet polka. You know, that's just how I came up. You know, I haven't played a polka in a long time, but I certainly could if somebody called me to play one. <laughs> So you learned to read and uh, you became versatile. And when you got to New York, you started hanging out. I mean, did you, what was your first steady gig in music when you got to New York? Okay, good, good question. In other words, I, I had worked and saved my money before I went to New York, you know, that summer. And he my sisters gave me a hundred dollars a piece. So, and I had it all figured. I knew how much money, and I went to Juilliard part time, and I had my money set aside for how much my tuition was going to be. I was just going part time. Plus, I was studying with Joseph Allard. I'm not sure if you if you know who Joseph Allard was, and, jo and that was a great, great, great person to run across at 18 years old. You know, and but money pretty ran out pretty quickly you know because and you got you got a room and it's twelve dollars a week or whatever and you know eat, eat, eat food and so that money i thought that money would last for a year but after a few months man i got one of the few day jobs that i ever had in my life and it was working at what was then first national city bank and making $60 a week on my day job, you see. And so that was my, but it, I got into, I started working as a musician pretty soon. So I had to, I, I quit that job after a few months because somebody, I, I was doing occasional jobs anyway, playing here and there. And then I went out on the road with a 
rock and roll. And they called me at work on Monday. Man, my tenor player didn't call up. Man, I need you to come and go to Hazleton, Pennsylvania with us, you know, and I'll pay you $125 a week. And, and, and I'm making 60 at the bank. And the, the guy that called me for the gig, he told me at that time that he would pay me $75 on weeks that we didn't work. Naturally, it was a big lie. You understand? But I said, so I went to my foreman. I said, oh, his name, oh, Walter was his name. I was an incoming male. You understand? I, and my number was 132. And I'd open the mail and I'd put it in the pigeonhole and so on. And so, and, but I'm hanging out all night <laughs> till four o'clock in the morning in these joints sitting in and playing. So I'd get to work, man. And, and if you made a mistake, they would call out your number, you know? So all day long, you would hear 132 and then you'd have to go back and correct your mistake. <laughs> but so finally, so this guy calls me for a gig in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, and I on a Monday. And I don't even know how he got, got in touch with me at work, but he called me. And he said, man, you got, you, you know, you got to, we'll pick you up at, at your apartment house and so on and so on. So I had to go to my foreman and tell him, look, man, I just got my big break in show business and I know I should give you a two week notice. But, and he said, no, I can't it's not a prison. I can't. So I quit my job and I go out there waiting for me uptown. And it was a band, it was a four piece. And there were three girl dancers, singers. They, I hadn't even met them before. So we, I get in the car and it's like a station wagon with a trailer pull, you know, pulling the instruments and so on. There's nine, eight, nine people in the station. <laughs> and, and I'm like young. I mean, the most, I'm like Gomer Piles, man. I was Gomer Piles most of my life. <laughs> but I'm, I'm really, I really, when I think back how Gomer I was back in those days. And so then I'm meeting and they say, oh, this is our new saxophone player. Before we could get over the George Washington Bridge, and I said, oh, yeah, and I quit my job. And the girl says, you quit your what? <laughs> and I knew that, I, that there's probably trouble ahead. And there was. There was you know. <laughs> but that's, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't had a day job since. Yeah, a, a, steady, <laughs> gig, a steady gig may be the, the, the most... Uh, Accurate oxymoron there, there is. There you go. There. <laughs> I've never heard of one. And now, I don't know, unless you work cats for like 15 years or something right, like that. Right. My whole mission is to counter all that that's going on in today's world. You know, as I think I mentioned to you, my record that I got coming out is called Diversitonic. And it addresses, because I've had a very diverse life. It's not about me. It's about society in general. And that, okay, we're all different. Get used to it. You understand? That's, that's, that's what bothers me because we're, we're so confused. The whole, our whole society is really screwed up more so than it should be because we've made progress and it seems like we're going backwards. Yeah. It, it makes me wonder if, there was a period, uh, a decade, or a series of years in your life where you felt we were really headed in the right direction as a country. I think it's. I think we've made progress all along. In other words, you see, history. Uh, all I know of for sure is seventy-five years. I'm living in a completely different world now than I was, let's just say, 50 years ago. We changed very much as a society. There's certain basics, but with te uh, technology, even when I first started playing, in other words, television was not necessarily, was new. And so people had to go out to get their, their fix of joy and, and social activity. So then you had television, mentioned rock and roll. That was a big change in society. Uh, but now you got the internet and cell phones. Most people are walking around with phones that are way smarter than they are, you know. And if you have a question, you don't 
have to ask a person. You, you can think of any question that you possibly think of and just talk to your phone and you'll have an answer just like that, you know. So, but, and that's, a, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think that people are way less engaging than I remember from years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you can't get two words out of a person or if you send a note to a person, they're going to answer you with an emoji or yeah. something. Or they'll express, they'll send you some initials that you don't even know what they stand for, a statement, or they'll use some hip phrase or something. I just, I just had it happen between the time we talked earlier. I said, said something to somebody, and they wrote back with some phrase, and I had to answer them. I said, I don't, I have no idea what you're talking about. You're, yeah, they're, they're, it's like cannonball, man. He <laughs> said. You, you don't decide you're hip. You either are or you aren't. Well, yeah, but hip, But he also said hipness is a state of mind, not That's a fact. Right. <laughs> and so, but that whole speech, now, what did he mean by that? And he talked about people who act. He's not, talk, he's not just talking about jazz people or so-and-so. See, that what people have to understand is you are who you are, so don't pretend to be somebody else, you understand? And don't try to put on some type of act that, that, that makes you feel good or makes somebody think that you're something that you're not. And then that's just a human, people do that. That's what human beings do. And it's not necessary, it's not, it doesn't really work that well. So, you know, the obvious is what it is, you know. And, so, uh, do you feel you had like, um internal voice or something that told you oh, it was time yeah. to move on uh oh yeah man that top see the internal voice oh my god we could talk four hours about that again i know i talk a lot but let me let me let me let me tell you about the internal voice back in the army station in fairbanks alaska now, around this time, I'm 20 years old, right? And so at one point, at one point I'm trying to figure out what am I going to do when I get out of the Army? Because I'd actually been working. I had a good, nice, steady gig before I got drafted. Now, but I was, I said, when I get out, I won't have that youth going for me. I we won't be talking about this little 19-year-old dinner because I'm going to be 20 years old. I'll be like an old man. You understand? So I'm trying to figure out, now, what am I going to do? So I go on leave, and I'm going through, I stopped in Seattle, Washington. And Miles was playing there, a club called, I can't think of the name right now. Cannonball made a live record there. I can't think of the name of the club, but Miles Davis, Ron Carter, Wayne Shorter, Tony Wade, they're working at this club. I'm on my way going back to Fairbanks and I got my army uniform on. So I get this idea. I said, I'm going to go to the club and I'm going to go see Miles Davis. When they take a break, I'm going to go up to Miles and say, hello, Miles. My name is Bill Easley and I play saxophone and so on and so on. And Miles is probably going to say, oh, really? Why don't you go get your horn and come play with us? You know that. And that's what the voice in my head is telling me that this is how it's going to be, you see. So I go to the club and I'm dressed in my army greens. And when they hit, it was like, some people had come from outer space, man. I had no idea what I was listening to. And I got up, it was out like an out of body experience. And I got out from my chair and I stood in, in front of the band and I watched the whole set and they took me to a journey in outer space that I never anticipated. By at the end of the set, my whole idea of going up to Miles and introducing myself disappeared. You spoke with the voice in my head said, go back to your hotel and hide under the bed. You understand? Because this is, this is, in other words, you may want to rethink what you want to do. Maybe you will become a chiropractor or something. This music thing may not be for you. But the voice said, clear as a bell, just go back to your hotel and just get under the bed. You know, so now I'm trying to get out of the club. I'm trying to leave. And the 
changing audiences. And I'm and and, and I my hat, I couldn't I'd left it under the chair where I was originally sitting, you know. I'm looking all around and I feel these piercing eyes on me. And at the end of Miles's outstretched hand is my army hat. And Miles says, is this what you're looking for? You know, and I grabbed the hat and I ran out of the club. I just ran out of the club. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even know, re remember my name. I just ran out of the club. So, I, 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 it was devastating. So, well, you know, there's other things in the world that I could do. And I go back to the base, clear as a bell. It's in my head. head. You got to get with a giant. You got to get with a giant. In other words, that means you got to get with somebody that knows more than you do, and so and so. So, and for, so I, I heard, I listened to the voice, and I went back to practicing and really getting as serious as I've always been in. At it. And so, I came out of the army in September of '67. By January of 68, I'm out on the road with George Benson, you understand, for two years. And he was a giant, you understand? He was a giant. I'm talking about when we were playing straight ahead, you know, this before he became a superstar. This is when we were out playing those joints and, and being on concerts with Miles and with Duke Ellington and with Monk and you name them, you understand? We're playing at the van, op, a Vanguard, maybe opposite. Uh, we opposite Bill Evans or a week opposite Herbie Hancock and the sex step and so and so. So that's that's where that evolved from that voice in your head. Um, trying to imagine your thinking about yourself when you were doing that those two years with with George Benson. Um, were you happy with your playing? Oh, no, I was, I, I'd go home and cry every night. You understand? Because George, George just plays all the George is just, and I was trying to play as many notes as he was and trying to be, you know, as technically proficient. And, and it was, it, George is, George is one of the greatest players with Jimmy Smith. I hung out with Phineas Newborn Jr. I've been around giants, you understand? So I know the difference between a giant and a regular player. I got to say, for instance, Sonny Stitt took me under his wings back maybe around that time or whatever. And I used to hang with Sonny and I'd try to pick Sonny's brain. And one time I, you know, we we're playing two weeks at a club Club Baron uptown. And we've so we'd gotten to be close and he liked me and he kind of you know thought I was so I asked him what he was thinking and so on and so on. And then he asked me a few questions. He said, Well, what, for instance, when you play I got rhythm and you get to the bridge, what's the first day? And and he saw me, he, I couldn't go like so and somebody looks at me very surprised and he says, hey, You don't know. And I said, Well, not really. So, and he looked, he said, he said, well, don't worry about it then. Cause he knew I could play, but I just didn't have, I didn't know what I was doing, you know. Uh -huh. so, but Sonny used to, when we'd hang out and talk and I'd be in his hotel room and we'd play and he would go over things. Sonny sit would, and Sonny was very stern, just like you, the character of Billy Mitchell or whatever. Some of those guys, man, were very stern. Stitt would look me right in my face, face and he'd say, Bill Easley, you know, you're a pretty good saxophone player, but I am a master. And I would say, well, yeah, yeah, Sonny, I, I pretty much know that, you know. So the, the, way back then, man, I've always been pretty comfortable. And Sonny Stitt thought I was pretty good, man. I never, I still don't have any desire to be a master. But Sonny Stitt thought I was pretty good, you know. Years and years and years later, I'm living in Memphis, Tennessee. And Sonny comes through Memphis and he tra Sonny would travel with and play with local rhythm sections and so. But during, and this, I hadn't seen Sonny in a long time. And by this time, I got a foot of hair and platform shoes and a full beard. And so 
go back to the dress room after the gig to see Sonny Stitt, you see. And Sonny Stitt had just come out of being in a coma for 13 days, 13 days. He was in a coma. And, but the thing is, man, he got to get back to work because you got to work. You understand? He's, he's, he's got to make money. So he's back out working. But, and he was, and so I go back and he's telling me about being in this coma and the fact that he couldn't remember anything of those 13 days. And, and we're talking and talking about this and talking about different things. I got ready to leave and I'm walking out of the dressing room and Sonny sits says to me, he says, he says, hey man, he said, can you tell me how I could get in touch with Bill Easley? Ooh. I said, well, I am Bill Easley, you know? And it was like, it was like one of them Twilight Zone moments where I'm thinking, Damn, Sonny Stitt is it's looking for looking for me, yeah. you know. So it was it was one of what I call one of my mountaintop moments. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You said yeah. you that's a great story. Uh, you said something a couple minutes ago that I want to follow up on. When he was asking you about the the bridge, so yeah. I got rhythm, and you said basically that I know what to do, but I don't necessarily know what it is I'm doing. Right. And in this day of um, intense jazz education, where you can study for years and get a PhD, I'm wondering how that mindset jives with what we're teaching now. Well, see, I, at this late stage in my life, I would like to teach, even when I went, but it seemed like people in academia avoid me like the plague you know they don't have no interest in me even though i've, I've done this for 60 some years and I, I pretty much accepted that by now but i have i've had a couple students here at home they come to my house and i'm trying to teach as a language more so than a technical even though see what sonny stitt told me about don't worry about it I didn't take that. That does not mean that, no, you shouldn't learn. The more information that you have, the better you are. Are you, 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 you are. But it's, there's different kinds of ways to approach any subject, man. There's various different parts of the brain that deal with it this way or this way. You can do the same thing different ways. You have an intellectual approach to it, or you have a certain thing, playing by ear. What does that mean? And so on, so on, so on. Because in fact, the notes are not the problem. It's the space between them. This and everything else. It's not how your birth date and your death date, it's about all that space in between. Or how do you get from here to Chicago? And, you know, it's so that's what music is or any language. It's about the space between. And so that's what sometimes people don't necessarily pay attention to, but it's, it's the most important thing. It's about that space between. Mm -hmm. That's, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not looking for a teaching position or anything like that, but I do enjoy teaching in the same way that I've always taught I'm not saying I never taught because over the years, somebody run to, man, I'd like to study with you. I'd like to take a, a I'd like to study. So, mm -hmm. say, well, first problem I have, I don't know what to charge you because I've never been a teacher. So I don't know what to charge you. So lesson one is free. You come to my house and I'll give you what I think is lesson one. I don't charge you. And the lesson one is a lesson that I got from Joe Allard, Way back in 1964, you understand? Joe Allard would have to take your instrument, clarinet or saxophone, or flies on any instrument, and they take you through a chromatic sequence of intervals. Now, we start with a major second up, minor second down, major, boo -de -do -de -do -de -do -de, down, de -do -de -do -de -do -de -do, you know, a chromatic sequence of intervals. You your seconds, minor seconds up and down, then expand it, minor third up, minor third, I made, you know, mm -hmm. 
major second down. Uh, fifth up, you know, the, the diminished uh, fifth down. Uh, you know, one note to the next, because anything that any music idea starts with two notes, being dun, 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 you know. So, so the whole thing is mastering from one note to the next. And so I would tell the student, I say, now listen, this is something you'll never master but just something you have to keep working on for the rest of your life. Now we can take that same concept and we can expand upon it. And we could write a book as thick as two telephone books. We take and we build major thirds on that, that, that movement or any four note motif that you come up with and take it through that cycle. In other words, and go over, put it on your, put it in your head and run it through, you know, put it on your arm. So that's, it's very basic information. And I always gave that as lesson one. Unfortunately, nobody ever came back for lesson two. So I never made a dime. You understand? They'd never come back. And I'd see them 30 years later. Oh, man, I'm still working on it. I said, well, I told you, you'll still work on it. But there's or there's more information actually, you know, but nobody, very few people want to come. The guy, I got a student now and he's, a, you know, he was in another, he's a scientist. Yeah. He prides himself as taking the most consecutive lessons from me, which is four, you understand? He says, he's trying to break anybody's record, man. All the, right. <laughs> and, 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 you know, but he believes me. And there have been a few people over the years that have believed what I was telling them. There was a girl that used to come and take lessons. She came the whole summer, clarinet, and I gave her this the idea that, that, and then I told her, I said, now I want you to come up the four note motif. I said, don't even think about it. Just come up with A, anything A through G label it natural sharp or whatever and then we'll put it together going up or down to get to those points and so she came up with these four notes do de do de something whatever and so that for her next lesson i wrote out this four note going through the key going through the chromatic sequence playing this uh, motif and i her name was mitsuyo and I had it all written out for, and the title was Mitsuyo's Motif, you know. So when she looked at it, she said, ah, so, she was so excited, you know. She was so excited that it was her name and it was yes. her neck, you know. And boy, she would, she went, when she would come for her lesson, I had to practice a day in advance to get ready for it, because she would she'd be fiddling through the thing. <laughs> I'd have, to, I'd have to get ready for it. But she's the only one that I had that was that ambitious. Well, that, that was very astute of you to come <laughs> up with that. So Yeah, yeah. I want to ask you about the, the Broadway uh, pit band part of your career. Uh-huh. Um, those are fairly coveted gigs, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, that, I sophisticated ladies, Broadway show. And that came about because of the fact that I had been, I went out on the road, right after Duke died, I went out with the band for about months or whatever. But the reason I went out with the band is because Stanley Dance had told Mercer, man, you got to find a clarinet player because the clarinet is a very important voice in Ellingtonia. And I actually was, Jimmy Hamilton had recommended or suggested that I get the gig before he, after, you know, when he was after, left the band, but it never did materialize at that time. But right after Duke died, I went out on the road with Mercer. And the only reason I went out because I was working with Isaac Hayes at that time. And this was during a period where we was out making a movie somewhere or something like that. Yeah. I left the band. Mercer was, he said, man, he said, you, you got an open chair in the band. Anytime you want to come back. So when he came, came through Memphis one time and they were, he was, they were getting ready, to, talking about doing a musical on Broadway. So Mercer invited me to come, you know, if you want to come back. So I moved back to New York with the promise of this job on Broadway. And uh, it, it's sort of what I aspired, the type of work that I've aspired to do in my lifetime. I, tur I turned down 
months when I got to New York in Jan January of 1980, three possibilities, going out with Horace Silver, Art Blakey, and going out with Panama Francis and the Savoy Sultans, you see. Make a long story short, I went out on the road. I turned down the gigs with Blakey and Horace Silver, because first of all, the, the jazz side men are the most underpaid uh Workers probably since, you know, I can't even go back. I don't even want to say. But that's just the history of jazz sidemen. Some money, but jazz sidemen in America are some of the mistreated, most mistreated people on the planet. And I won't, you probably know about that. So I won't, I'll spare you the details of how the jazz thing works, you know. So, I sort of had a half a jazz career, but I did enough Broadway shows and enough recording that was more geared towards stability than creativity. Hmm. I know I talk a lot. No, jump no, in, I jump in anytime because those are great. Uh, stability and creativity. I think that's um, very important for musicians to have a balance there because if they only have stability, they'll they'll be one of the, those. Grumpy yeah. people who just... Uh, yeah, there's a lot of those, right? <laughs> did, did you have, a, did you have a, something you did when you were in the pit to help keep focused when you had 84 measures of rest and then you had to come in? Um, because it's been my observation that, you know, when you play a show over and over and over, you have these long periods of not playing that your mind can start going out Very, you know what that's that's a brilliant point and i i i i my my experience is totally because that's the norm see that's the norm it's like going to it's going to the assembly line i see you have to realize i had a very very unique broadway career in other words i went to sophisticated ladies did a called black and blue you know which was filled with jazz all stars i did jelly's last jam where the clarinet was just all throughout the whole thing blowing and I, most of my shows have been not been your typical broadway shows you see they've been jazz themed shows and most of my chairs have been with me in mind you see i've been hired for for you know easily because that's what bill easily does you know and so i bet my 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 experience is not typical if, if i'm playing a broadway show or anything that i'm playing i'm just not involved with the show or the music Horn is in my face i'm involved with the whole experience no, I can't. I, my norm is not to, okay, play this and then pick up a book and read a chapter of this. No, if I go to work, I'm there to work and I'm involved with all, at not just my part, but everybody, everything going around me and during the actors and the singers. In other words, I used to go to work every night in black and blue. Oh, what is Sir Roland Hannah going to play tonight? You understand? What is he going to play tonight? You know, and that, and so that, no, not, I, I hate to brag, many people have had that kind of experience, you mm -hmm. see. Yeah. It's okay with me if you brag. No, I, I you know, because you'll turn, you'll turn me off. <laughs> no, no way. <laughs> I well, mean, no, I listen, man, I, I, I can't help but to brag because I've, I've had a, a, a best life. And I've never, we talk about them cats that are mad all the time and so and so. I've never been one of those guys, you know. I live in three states of truth, the state of gratitude, and the state of happiness. And everything else is a waste of my time, see. And I'm, and I'm still living that way, you know. That's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> Past, present, and future all exist simultaneously. Uh, on your website, you had a series of thoughts of the day. And uh, you seem to be an optimist because in May 4th of 2020, when 
uh, things were really bad with COVID. And uh, isolation is the perfect environment to practice, you said. Preparing oh, yeah. for the best outcome. Prepare for the best outcome. The worst outcome will take care of itself. I mean, that's, that's not rocket science, man. The worst always, you know, if a tornado hits, man, you know, you try to get out of its way. You know, but, but, but you don't hope for a tornado, you know. So that's, that's hey, man, that's just simple, simple simple, simple logic, man. In other words, it's good and bad. There's two extremes to everything, man. Everything that exists, exists in yin and yang, you know, man, woman, day, night, you know, winter, summer, whatever. Everything, and there's naturally, there's a whole lot in between good and evil. And so good force and evil force, I mean, they both exist, man. And so, you you know, it's a better choice which do you want to gravitate toward. Well, we've been at this for about an hour. It's been oh, really my wonderful. Goodness. I'm going to let you talk no, next no. time. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering um, if you have anything to say about the state of our country, because you are an observer of human nature, and you're just talking about extremes. Mm -hmm. You have anything you can comment on? Well, my my current mission, man, my current thought, and my current project is, and it, it's more. I, I got a CD a record coming out in April. I did it here locally in Durham, you know, and with guys I didn't even really know that well. I I brought in a ringer from New York, an organ player by the name of Kyle Kohler, because I played with all of the great organ players. Every single I played probably played with more great organ players than anybody on the planet. Jimmy Smith, Jimmy McGriff, you can't name but maybe two organ players that I didn't play with. So I never made an organ record, sort of a, a record with an organ uh, vibe on it. But the name of it is Diversitonic, Diversitonic. And, and it, it's inspired by what's going on now. And, and the truth is, stop, man, like worrying about the fact that we're all different, man, because that we are, and the fact of life, man, we're, we're all different. And, you know, we should just respect each other for our differences. And naturally, we don't necessarily have to all agree, but we have to respect each other. Or else <laughs> we're, we're headed towards self-destruction. Hmm. That is, is, it's, it's simple, man. It's simple. We get, you know, the best way to get some respect is to die. And then everybody, oh, no, everybody's interested in you then. But no, respect the living, you know, because uh, it's important and, and we'd have such a better, better world. And, you know, be concerned with your, your fellow man certainly have enough on earth to go around, but yet we have people in terrible shape. And it's been that way since the beginning of time. So life itself and humanity should be about self-improvement. You know, in other words, goal today is to be better than we were yesterday. And it's not, I mean, it's, it, it takes work, very important. Why, why would you want to be worse today? You know, and that things have you get sick and so on, so on. Yes. But spiritually, psychologically, you have to keep trying to be better. Well, Cut me off because I, no, I know no, no. I ramble. <laughs> you said it in one of your thoughts. You said, I'm a definitely a better musician at 71 than I was at 21. And oh, certainly, well, I'm better at 75. And certainly a wiser person. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. You are, too. <laughs> I've known you since 1995. <laughs> You're way smarter, man. You're way smarter. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to get that in writing, Bill. <laughs> I'll write it down. <laughs> well, I want to... I want to thank you. I didn't you mean to ramble so no, long. No, no, that's, that's why we're... You, you, you knew it. When you called me, you knew what you were in for. Just... I, I, 
<laughs> Billy Mitchell, you knew you were going to catch hell. <laughs> I liked it. All right. I appreciate your time. Hey, man, and, it's uh, been an honor. an honor. Well, thank you very much. And um, best of luck with that new recording. And uh, I, I enjoy your outlook on life. Uh, I can relate very well to it, you know, making... Um, making a living in music by doing whatever comes up and doing it well. If it's paying, I'm playing. All right. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, my friend. I'll see Have you a on good the day. Flip side.